I want to start this episode with an apology in advance because many of your cherished illusions about therapies and health practices are about to be shattered. Today, I present to you Paul Ingram, the guru of your gurus, destroyer of illusions and an ex-massage therapist. He's writing for professionals on painscience.com since the dawn of the internet. His specialty are the very topics that sane, evidence-based health experts avoid like the plague. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. That's a great introduction. That was fun. Thank you. Let me tell you my story, how I encountered you and what do I know about you. Sure. So it started way back in, in, in high school. I was playing football. I think even in Canada, you guys call it soccer, maybe? We do. Yeah. So I was playing that and I was craving some massage, but I couldn't get it. There was no massage available there. So, but I felt like I, I, I needed massage. I didn't know what it is, but I, I was craving a lot. Later on in my life, I moved to Taiwan and I got massages. I got, I went to massages every day, twice, sometimes wow. even three times when I didn't like the previous massage, I went to the next one. You know, there is massages everywhere in Taiwan and, and I had to like, like try to figure out, okay, what body parts of mine to massage next, because this one is still sore from the previous massage. So anyway, this is where, uh, where I have found your, your articles. So in, in Taiwan, it's, it's pretty convenient because you're just walking on the street and you sit in to a massage place and they are massaging your feet and why they are doing that. You can be on your phone. Right, they don't speak the same language. You can't talk to them. So while I was getting the massages, I was reading about massages <laughs> from you, <laughs> and and I got hooked. I I I definitely got hooked. After that, I went to massages all over the world. I was uh, I was traveling the world for for like I don't know uh, ten years maybe. Uh, but later on, I get back to my my uh, my my home place, and there are no available good massages or or even massages. I mean, so then I decided to read your book uh, about the trigger point therapy mm -hmm. book. Right, that's your your main book. It's a it's a very long one. And took yeah. me a year every day to read. <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a monster. Mm -hmm. I could never look back. Mm. Yeah, sorry about that. So then, I, as I was reading your book, I I I realized because I I got a bit disillusioned by massage. Right, I was getting massage all the time, and it wasn't. I didn't know what it was doing. It wasn't doing anything at all. That's how I felt. And, and, and then when I was reading your book, then I, I realized that there are, or maybe there aren't these trigger points, <laughs> these things, those you push on and then they improve. And that's what I realized that at that time that, oh, I was going to massages, but whenever the massage therapist got to a trigger point, they spent their, I don't know, like, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and then they moved on. So from that time on, when I started massaging myself based on your, your book and, and, and with a, with a bunch of balls and massage tools and all kinds of stuff, then I realized that, oh, wow, things are improving and I'm self massaging myself. Unlike getting the massages from, I wouldn't say professionals. So normal massage. So so now I am doing self massages, and I found a massage therapist who I could teach 
to get from therapy. So now, excellent. Now I have someone. Now I have someone who can also do what I was doing for myself. And finally, at uh, cherry on top is that I really liked your writings because your your writing your writing is interesting. It's not just informative. It's it's funny. It's uh, it's like uh, like you're a real writer, you know. <laughs> so so I I also decided to read your Plantar Fasciatis book. Um, I didn't even know I had plantar fasciitis at that point. I thought every it's just part of life that people so is is hurting. <laughs> but but uh, but anyway. So yeah, that was a that was a that was a long book, and and maybe I should mention that I have a treat for you. I've been preparing, I've been testing uh, plantar fasciitis treatments every two weeks i change and for the last half a year i've been testing which one works for me and at one point when i get bored of this i just create a create a list that hey this thing did this and this thing did this and this is how it's improved and you might you might find it valuable or not so that's uh that's a lot of lot of talk and very little <laughs> questions. Well, you did take a year to read the book, so presumably it would take a while to tell the story. You've got a fair <laughs> bit of background with me, considering you were meeting for the first time. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, but did I did I make a mistake here? A uh, near introduction was a uh, or was it correct? Uh, well, I it, it, I thought it was really fun <laughs> but uh but i'm not necessarily the crusher of dreams i used to be a really fiery debunker i am much less so now but yep there's i will i will shatter some illusions uh, you know there's there's a plenty of stuff in my head that will mess with people's beliefs about healthcare. Uh, but i do try to be gentle about it and it's really important to understand that i used to be a believer in many silly things. I used to be a very foolish young man who believed almost anything. And I've been through the process of having my own illusions shattered. Uh, so I've got a lot of empathy for people who are on that journey now. So you are a skeptic. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. And, and what does it mean for you to be a skeptic? Because for me, what I understand of a skeptic is you see there is Descartes and Descartes invented a demon that can mask all kinds of truths from him and then he somehow figured out that the only thing he cannot doubt is that he thinks therefore he exists or but a skeptic a real skeptic even doubts that part even doubts that you think that you exist and the therefore, right? Like, that's the skeptic in a philosophical sense. But there seems to be another kind of skeptic, which you are, which is some kind of head, head skeptic. Can you talk about that philosophy of yours a bit more? Yeah, I would probably call myself a, a scientific skeptic. Um, it's important when you're talking about skepticism to distinguish uh, skepticism from denialism or cynicism. Uh, these are things that are on the spectrum of skepticism, but uh, some skepticism goes really off the rails in certain directions. So questioning everything, for instance, is not necessarily good skepticism. Some things are a waste of time to question excessively because we know enough that we don't really need to question them. So knowing what to question is part of the skeptic process. I'm curious. I'm interested to know how the world really works. And what motivates everything in my skepticism is simply wanting to understand and asking questions like, will this Epsom salts bath actually make me less sore after working? Is that true? I want to know. I want to understand. 
it probably does not. No. <laughs> one of one of the traditional illusions that I shatter. Um, that's a, a large topic, uh, but the quick answer is uh, no. It probably doesn't make you less sore. Uh, and and I had that question soaking in an Epsom salts bath myself in t- 2003 or something. And I started studying and I started writing, trying to answer the question for myself. I try not to have a dog in any fight, as the expression goes. I try to approach every question with childlike curiosity. And my goal is to find out how the world really is as best we are able. And it's well worth pointing out (laughs) that we often just can't know. Uh, And being comfortable with that uncertainty is also a big part of my skepticism. One more point about the skepticism thing. So it's a great question to start with. I think it's important. Um, is that a lot of skepticism is just not very good quality. It's knee-jerk, simplistic, um, often as simplistic as the faith and true belief that it tends to criticize. There are a lot of enthusiastic new skeptics. I did it myself when I was a brand new card-carrying skeptic, and I was excited to be involved in the community of skeptics. Um, I was uh, a pain in the ass, and my my thinking on the topic was pretty basic. But good skepticism, good critical thinking, good critical analysis is a complicated skill, and it has to go way beyond simply um, casting shade and doubt at anything that sounds sketchy, uh, which is really, that's all skepticism is to some people, uh, is just, uh, just being... Um, you know, a bit of an I told you so. And uh, people hate that. People don't like that kind of skepticism, and it gives skepticism a bad name. So I try to steer well clear of that and be much more substantive and be you know, truly interested in understanding how things work. In the meantime, I was trying to dig up a quote from Nietzsche. I just uh, I just, I just, <laughs> figured that, hey, he, he actually said something interesting. I couldn't f- find it. but uh, he, said, he said a few interesting ske- things. <laughs> yeah, but uh, regarding skepticism, yeah. that skepticism is a sign of a weak character. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I don't recall that quote. <laughs> uh, I, will, I, will, I will find it is one of my favorites. Um, any, anyhow, so what I found also interesting is that there was a time for you when the mob came with pitchforks mm-hmm. for the skeptic. Yep. You know, people don't really understand an experience like that. Or or, or would you say you got cancelled at that point? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that term wasn't in the culture at the time that this happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you, could, you could fit what happened to me under the umbrella of being cancelled. I was basically drummed out of the massage therapy profession. I also left of my own accord because I was... Uh, physically tired of being a massage therapist, ready to move on for other reasons anyway. But uh, but the profession was making it very unappealing for me to stay, which is an understatement. Uh, and so I, I left. I quit in 2010 and went to full-time science journalism. Uh, and I began, you know, my career in science journalism in earnest in a, in a firestorm of controversy. I was... Uh, an apostate, uh, an alternative medicine professional who had turned on his own kind and rejected uh, really common and prevalent uh, you know, pseudoscientific beliefs uh, in alternative medicine generally and massage therapy specifically. And uh, you know, for a lot of my former colleagues, uh, you know, that they could hardly believe that someone like me existed, let alone tolerate my existence. I uh, it was you know it was definitely a very unpopular individual with an awful lot of my uh, former colleagues and still am to this day, although just generally I'm much less controversial now than I used to be. I'm far more mature, (laughs) diplomatic. I'm nicer. I was a bastard about it initially. I really pushed people's buttons as hard as I could deliberately. And, uh, and I think that that, you know, more or less had the predictable result. And, so in some ways, I look back on what happened and I'm, I'm, I'm almost sympathetic with the people who attacked me in a way. And they're, you know, still basically my enemies. <laughs> but but I, I get it. I, I understand why I was an irritant in 
that system, uh, that the, the immune system of my profession reacted violently to my presence and got very inflamed. And it's easy to see why looking back on it. So the final point I want to drive home about skepticism is that you see you, you are writing and researching about topics those are esoteric. That's how I found you because I was trying to to find anyone who is talking about you know massage and not full of shit. So, so so it's 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 very rare, and and this is where the value of skepticism um, puts puts you in a good good position to 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 talk about these for people like like me who are really really looking for the truth i want to go through a couple of things as a as, as, as a warm-up to to people to understand your positions first what do you think about stretching <laughs> i knew it <laughs> i was i was betting which topic it would be <laughs> stretching is it i mean this is one of my most traditional debunking topics and it tends to really break people's brains because people have a, a lot of unexamined faith in stretching uh, this is a huge topic and like many of the topics i write about i have a huge article about it in fact i have multiple articles about stretching and my bona fides on almost any topic like this that i that i speak on are that i've spent an immense amount of time studying it for a long long time so my my stretching skepticism goes back to the early 2000s, in more than 20 years. And uh, the simple version of the very complicated story is that stretching is overrated as a pillar of fitness. Um, and I will say right away, because everybody needs to hear this before they can handle the skepticism, yes, stretching feels good, and that's why I do it still to this day, despite my skepticism because it feels like scratching an itch, because it's a very nice feeling. So no, stretching is not entirely useless. It is at least pleasant feeling, if nothing else. But the traditional things that people assume that stretching is good for, the specific fitness goals that it allegedly uh, helps you with, none of that holds up to scrutiny. It doesn't do what people think it does. There's a little tiny bit of room left over when you've dealt with all of those for the possibility that it does something that we aren't used to giving it credit for, uh, that it has effects that we haven't defined and studied and measured. But there's not a lot of room for that. And certainly the reasons that people have for stretching in their minds, if they're even thinking about it at all, or if you press them and you say, no, stop, think about it. Why are you stretching? If they give you that answer. It's almost always going to be something that stretching doesn't actually do. So it's not a good warm up. It doesn't prevent injury. It doesn't reduce soreness after workouts. It will make you more flexible. That is true. Uh, but not everybody, not easily, not cost effectively. And to what end? Flexibility as a goal of stretching is itself a subcategory of uh, something that's overrated. Uh, most people don't need to be much more flexible than they already are, and flexibility is generally um, not nearly as useful a human trick as we assume. People love the idea of flexibility uh, and tend to perceive it as being inherently valuable with a very strong assumption that you need to be flexible to do all kinds of things. And that's just generally overheated and overblown. Uh, most people don't particularly need to be more flexible. And in my writing, I go into lots of detail about that because that's really, for people who haven't thought about it before, who haven't dived into this topic, that's a really, really tough pill to swallow. <laughs> it just takes time and examples and lots of citations and lots of persuasion to get people to start uh, you know, getting used to the idea that, yeah, maybe this actually isn't the best use of my time. 
Time for that water. So there we go. That's that's the initial. Uh, that's that's the basic stretching speech. That's the basic stretching speech. Um, spoiler alert! In my plantar fasciitis experiment, stretching yep. was that made things much much worse, worse than how mm. bad it was started out with. Oh, no. But of course, there is always a possibility that I've overdone stretching. Right, so. Yeah. Um, I believe you about stretching. Uh, I don't think it is very useful, but I still stretch a lot. Um, the way that I swallow the pill is, I don't, I don't consider myself as stretching. So I don't, I don't even do, you know, just don't keep doing this. Uh, what was the static stretching? Yeah. I what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to move in a stretched position. So when I'm f- doing a follow along video that's doing static stretching, I'm not static stretching. I'm I'm moving in that position, and for some reason, I I feel that that might do something something better than than just just stretching your muscles which which i i kind of feel that it's uh it's making me even worse than 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 better off if i'm just doing static stretching we can also think about yoga um even though you're not a fan of stretching i believe you're not against yoga right well yoga is a a, a superset um that contains stretching yoga is a giant bucket full of all kinds of health practices bundled together with a bunch of cultural and folk medicine practices that happens to include stretching so Mm -hmm. it's in a in scientific parlance it is uh, heavily confounded we can't really assess the benefit or value of stretching in the context of yoga uh, because there's so much going on is stretching an active ingredient in yoga? I think probably not because of all the other work that I've done on stretching. I doubt that stretching is what makes yoga what it is. Whether or not yoga as a whole is beneficial is a separate question. Uh, whether or not there are other ingredients in yoga that are useful is a separate question. And there's a lot of ingredients, so it's it's actually it's a bunch of separate questions. <laughs> Uh, so I don't, uh, p- particularly where we're talking about cultural practices that, you know, practices that have cultural significance to people, um, I'm a lot more careful about saying, yeah, well, that doesn't work. With stretching, you've got a much more straightforward equation of if you do X, allegedly Y will happen. Uh, that's a very specific claim that we can evaluate. But yoga has so many different kinds of potential benefits, including the you know, social element of doing an exercise with a group of people. It's just a lot messier is what I'm trying to say. So I'm much more, you know, I'm, I'm much less inclined to say, well, that doesn't work. It depends on what for, what, what, what do you want out of yoga? There's a lot more possibilities. So it's not possible to, uh, to say that it doesn't work or to dismiss it uh, in a knee jerk fashion. While I was reading you, I was always wondering if you're familiar with the the anima flow, uh, prima movements kind of workouts. Are you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you, you, I don't think you've ever written about those, but as I've been, I've been practicing everything, and it's not an overstatement. So, so what I'm doing is that every every week. I do um, a video, a follow-along video every single day, and every week I change the follow-along video. And this way I am practicing like every single thing that exists has practice in the world. So one thing that I've noticed is that, you know, this shoulder stuff, uh, especially these animal movements are seem to be seem to be quite quite a novel stimuli that sure. don't really get from not, not even from yoga or, or anything like that so 
I was just wondering if you encountered these in your rehab practices. Yeah, it, it, I've never written about it because it doesn't come up in a rehab context very often. I mean, there's there are a whole bunch of movement-inspired rehab uh, modalities, but this specific idea, pretty unusual. I mean, honestly, it's been years since I even last heard anyone mention it. Uh, I know it's out there, and I know that there's people who are paying attention to it, but it's not something that I paid a lot of attention to. Um, and again, I would put it—I would put it in the messy category. You know, that is somewhere on a on a broad spectrum between exercise and almost art or self psychotherapy. You know, it's very it makes me think of mask work in theater and drama. I have no doubt that it can be quite psychologically potent and affecting, kind of cool and kind of weird. What effect that has on rehab and pain? An injury, I mean, honestly, that's so far outside of anything that's been studied rigorously, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to comment on from the perspective of a science journalist. Um, uh, you, know, you could, I think I would put it in the same category, say, as uh, almost the same category as art therapy, which is you know, a very, very high level thing to do with your brain that may or may not trickle down to specific health benefits that you need, you know, when you're struggling to recover from plantar fasciitis or whatever it might be. And th those those kinds of things, uh, I kind of just put them all in, in one basket of, hey, if it floats your boat, <laughs> go for it. Because we don't really have much to say one way or the other about whether or not it's uh, medically beneficial. I've been wondering if you will ever have, because how do you how do you study something where yeah. one of the essential ingredients is random movement? <laughs> so, yeah. Another thing that you don't mention, and now that is surprising to me, why you are not really talking about that, is. Mm. The ice plunge, the ice baths, they become pretty, pretty, pretty popular lately, and you're not mm -hmm. really talking about them, oh, even but though I you're am. talking a lot about ice. You've, uh, you've, okay. you've, you've missed it. I've started writing about cryotherapy. I now have a page about cryotherapy on the oh, website. So okay. fairly new, hasn't been there for that long. Uh, but yeah, you're you're absolutely right that it was neglected for a while, and I still have more work to do. I mean, I have more work to do on all of my topics forever but uh, that one so what did you find is, i i mean what are we uh, talking about a specific practice are you talking about ice baths is that what you're asking about uh, is there uh, like a physiological difference between an ice bath and cryotherapy i yeah. i mean it, the terms are used fairly sloppily um let me just uh, let me just get my own article up here so cryotherapy is hot is called air uh, ice bath is called water there we go. Subtitle, The Science of Freezing Your Butt Off to Treat Pain or Enhance Recovery from Intense Exercise. Um, so, yeah, this is the, my the article that I've added relatively recently to the website is about um, ice baths and cryo chambers. Whole, whole body cooling, systemic cooling by any method is the focus of the article. It, was that what you were asking about or something more specific? Yes, yes, that's, that's it. That is, yeah. Um, I, I mean, it is largely inconclusive. We don't have enough good data on it to say that it's beneficial. Um, it's in that um, it, it's in that annoying state uh, where what science we have shows some promise. You know, it's promising, which is a dangerous word in this business. But there's also um, a lot of bullshit claims associated with it. And, and really entire, almost literally empires of, uh, you know, commercial empires based on promoting certain beliefs and ideas about it. So it's it's problematic, even if it is somewhat beneficial, as with so many other things in this field, even if there's a seed of truth, uh, unfortunately, there's also a whole lot of nonsense around it. It's a good, good segment to breath work. Oh, jeez. You are practicing <laughs> bioenergetic Breathing, and you know what? I tried to find anything on YouTube that I can follow along, and I found things. Those are not what you're talking about. 
probably so. Not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk about exotic. Yeah. Yeah. But you're a fan of it, even though it's again like just promising. <laughs> yeah, and what I just said a little while ago about uh, the movement stuff, uh, you know, this this like, almost gets into it's it's way f so far out on the spectrum of uh, possibilities that it's it's more like art or psychology or expression uh, therapy than anything to do with rehab. Uh, the background story here is before I became a skeptic, in my youth, I got involved with an organization on um, Gabriola Island off the coast of uh, the west coast of Canada, um, which was uh, an experiential uh, encounter group therapy uh, school. Sure, that's a good summary. Um, uh, most people will be familiar or many people will have heard of Esalen in the United States in California, um, a famous hippie healing healthcare center. Haven was the Esalen of the North, and I spent a lot of time there when I was younger, and they taught a style of uh, breathing therapy, uh, which they generally called bioenergetic breathing or round breathing. And this is, it's all about catharsis. It's all about emotional catharsis. It's about stimulating emotional events. And, uh, and I found over the years that it got, you know, the psychology content sort of trailed off and I started to think of it more and more in terms of a, a changing your physiological state exercise and it certainly does do that you're, you're hyperventilating probably the closest overlap with anything that people know about is uh, the Wim Hof method there's a quite a bit in common between the two uh, but what I learned at Haven almost nobody's ever even heard of that um, you know, 30 years ago it was a bit bigger a deal but uh, it's really obscure today uh, and we should say what it is. We're basically talking about fast, deep breathing, particularly uh, where I learned it in a coached um, psychotherapeutic context. So uh, a common sight at Haven was to see somebody doing a lot of really fast, deep breathing and then having super intense, emotionally expressive experiences, lots of crying, lots of screaming. And so that that's where that came from and I wrote about it early in my career and occasionally I still play with it but it's getting pretty shit I did when I was a young man thing it's getting very far in my past now um the difference between the Wim Hof breathing is that there are no breath holds right in this yeah mm -hmm. yeah you know I I'm doing this because my lungs are not in the best conditions so i just trying to cycle through a bunch of breathing exercises over the years and uh and right mm -hmm. now i'm doing the, the the wim hof stuff anyway the the main main topic main topic let's move on to the main topic which is massage <laughs> yeah, and trigger which points is, ah yes massage and trigger points yeah. how can we keep this short right <laughs> Do trigger points exist? The the twenty minute version of the <laughs> three hundred thousand word book. <laughs> I'm there. I'm very practiced talking about this, so I can give you a short version. Do they exist? Sore Please. spots exist. Sore spots exist, and uh, the term trigger point, uh, which emerged in the eighties and the nineties, is the label given to these unexplained trigger points. And it tends to imply a certain cause. The name trigger point has come to be associated with specific ideas about how they supposedly work. Literally nobody is doubtful about the existence of sore spots. This is a thing that happens to humans. We develop sensitive, fairly discrete spots. Usually feels like they're in muscle tissue, but not always tend to be associated with aching and weakness. Um, that phenomenon is, uh, there is no significant skepticism about that, even from the most fiery trigger point skeptics. They don't question the fact that, yeah, we, we get these weird sore spots. It's a thing that humans do. All the controversy is about how they work. Unfortunately, this has translated into a common skeptical failure, I think, 
which is to say that trigger points don't exist. You'll hear many skeptics, many of whom are, you know, some of my friends and allies over the last 15 years in this business. They will say without nuance, the trigger points don't exist. What they mean is that it's not, there's, they don't believe that it is a lesion in muscle tissue. They don't believe that it works the way the dominant narrative says it works. They're not actually saying you don't have sore spots. They're saying they don't think that it's a thing that you can rub in a muscle. That is, that is also debatable, but that is what the skepticism is actually aimed at. So a big focus of my writing on this topic has been to try to understand, is there a lesion? Is there a, a something that you can take a picture of or sample tissue chemistry of what's going on in the muscle? Uh, what's going on in the sore spot? What makes it go? And that is an unanswered scientific question. We have some evidence. It is partial at best. There is evidence that there is a thing in muscle tissue. Despite the skepticism, that evidence does exist. And so it is possible that trigger points work something like the usual narrative, which is, by the way, that it's a little tiny cramp. The tiny cramp story of trigger points is that these sore spots are basically little patches of dysfunctional, tight muscle tissue. There's a formal name for the hypothesis. There's lots and lots of pathophysiology uh, speculation about how it works, but very little hard evidence to confirm it. And skeptics will tend to say, well, we've been looking for... 30, 40 years. So isn't this the same as a chiropractic subluxation, for instance, that it's just a figment of our imagination and we need to stop looking? Um, I don't think it's the same. I think that uh, I think that it's just a legitimate area of ignorance. We just actually don't know. And it's hardly surprising when you when you know the world of the, the science of aches and pains and injuries, you know that it's you should never be surprised that something hasn't been studied adequately. Nothing has been studied adequately. Nothing. So uh, it's not a shock that we don't have the evidence. And so that's a, well, there we go. That's a, that's a rambly intro to trigger points. Okay. So I was thinking about this and I think there could be a renaissance of massage therapy, mm. but we need one thing. We need to detect, let's say, trigger points, but it doesn't have to be trigger points. We need to, we need a device to detect something that we can keep mm. rubbing and detect it when this thing goes away, right? If we can mm. qualify and show the progress, then, well, that's kind of like, hey, look, that's how your muscles grow. That's how your fat goes down. That's how your trigger points goes away. So if want to develop such device and maybe maybe some protocol or practices based on that, then well interesting things would happen um in the world. I, I mean I mean look like my my trigger points, I'm not just when I was when I was, I'm still doing, I'm massaging them out. I actively feel that, hey, these pains that I had for, for, for very long, long time, they, they are one by one disappearing and holy shit, like that's amazing, you know? So I think that's exactly the right idea in principle. It'd be wonderful to have objective evidence not only of the existence of a trigger point in the first place, but of it yielding to a therapy. Unfortunately, I also think it's a pipe dream. Uh, we have a couple of technologies that are pro possibly capable of identifying the trigger point, of showing it, uh, but they're not clinically useful. They're laboratory stuff, right? Things things that take tremendously, you know, skilled setup to do with a handful of people in a research context. 
Uh, we're very, very far from being able to wave a scanner over the body and say, there's a trigger point before treatment, and then wave it over the same area after treatment. See, see, now it's gone. Long, long way from that. In fact, I would guess that we will likely never get there. Not in the world we live in today. But it sure is the right idea in principle. Well, the best way to predict the future is to invent it yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a great need for many things like this throughout the field of, of pain and injury, which is generally more primitive than people think. It's surprisingly still pretty wild westy uh, treating pain and injury. We need we, There's a whole bunch of innovation that is needed, but that innovation also needs to be based on a, you know, a foundation of respect for science. And right now, almost everything that is described as innovation or cutting edge or bleeding edge in, in the field is wild profiteering speculation. Highly profitable snake oils are, are framed as cutting edge. And so getting stuff that's actually advanced, actually sophisticated, is uh, really going to be a challenge. I guess I have more confidence in market processes than you are, but uh, I would like to switch gears a little bit and 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 before we wrap it up, I I'm doing a, so so right now I'm trying to bring some stable information to my listeners with you, mm -hmm. but I'm also doing another series with the rejuvenation Olympics athletes. Um, which is about, well, people competing with each other who can slow down their aging or turn back, age backwards the most. And I was wondering if you've ever, like, looked into longevity or looked into these biological aging clocks. Well, only as a uh, someone who's generally interested in health science. It's not something that I focused on, it's certainly well, you know, it's outside of my lane as a, a science journalist specializing in pain and injury. Even even the world of pain and injury itself is is too large for one person to specialize in. You can't specialize it, it's too big. Uh, and uh, aging and longevity is, there's a little overlap. There's a little, uh, the, and the overlap is basically that so much of pain and injury is essentially uh, aging. It is the beginning of aging, and as you, uh, it, it is what defines aging. It's a major thing that defines it. Um, if someone were uh, 90 years old and had no aches and pains uh, and no injuries, they, in a very real sense, wouldn't be 90 years old as we know it. Our capacity, our tendency to hurt, uh, how easily we're injured, our vulnerability to to the chronification of pain. These are the things that make aging what it is. And so to to some extent, I'm quite interested in the topic. Are you familiar with the term inflammaging? Yes. It's part right. of the hallmark of aging. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so there is where the over, overlap is. And in fact, when we're done here, uh, I'm going to be rushing to get a really big post out the door that's really all about inflammation, or at least uh, um, a whole big category of things that contribute to it. Let's define that quickly for people listening. It's the This is the escalation of systemic inflammation with age. It is the mechanism of a lot of what goes wrong as we age, from metabolic syndrome and heart disease and strokes and heart attacks, all the way down to needing a knee replacement uh, and everything in between. So I'm very interested in inflammation as a driver of pain chronicity and vulnerability to injury. And so to the, to the extent that I'm interested in inflammation, also interested in aging, uh, but not very, not very familiar with the, the physiology of senescence. Okay. Okay. So the current paradigm is the hallmarks of aging and one of the hallmark is inflammation. So that yeah. might be something people are very interested in who are listening to this. So, Sure. In science.com, inflammaging, if that mm -hmm. will be the title. Yeah. Now, let me ask you the contrarian question, which okay. is, what's one thing 
that you strongly believe to be the case, but very few people agree with you on. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of possibilities. Okay, there's a good one I could put at the top. There's three dozen possibilities, but I think probably my um, my position on placebo being overhyped is um, not shared by many people. Almost everyone, including skeptics, like to uh, believe in the power of placebo. Not all skeptics. Some some skeptics are on board with me on this, but I, I have a quite a strong uh, evidence based belief uh, that placebo is not particularly powerful and even even more controversial that it isn't um, particularly good at analgesia at relieving pain and I see I see this all the time whenever the topic comes up on social media I see you know people who are my you know my intellectual allies in almost every other way will push back on this and uh, in some way they will uh, they will express their belief that placebo is powerful in general, or that it is at least powerful for pain. And uh, I don't believe that it is. So that's pr that's a pretty good example of something I'm I'm pretty far out and um, uh, on my own with that belief. All right, all right. I didn't know that. <laughs> mm. So my final question is: as I mentioned, I'm a capitalist, actually an anarcho capitalist of that. And my final question, I'm asking this to, to everyone. Why should people give you money? Yeah, why indeed? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think about it all the time. It was much simpler when I just sold eBooks. Uh, and by the way, I don't, um, I've never made a living as a science journalist from advertising. I am, uh, I'm a writer. I was a writer be before I was a massage therapist, which is probably why you like my writing and why it seems like I'm a real writer because I was for many years before. So, you know, why should, why should people give money to writers? You know, that's to me that it kind of turns into that question. Um, when I sold mainly eBooks and never advertising on the website, never sponsorships, never affiliate links. I always steered well clear of the corrupting forces of, of that. It was a very straightforward value proposition, collected a whole bunch of information about a topic, wrote about it well, and said, if you want a deep dive that's, you know, three to 17 times more detailed than anything else you can find online on this topic, and, and you like my the way my mind works and my priorities and my sensibilities, then let's trade. You give me 20 bucks, I'll give you the information. That was really straightforward. It is, uh, the, the ebook business is bad for the last five years uh, due to changes in how the internet works and problems with Google. Um, I basically stopped being able to make a living selling ebooks and I've had to pivot to memberships, to uh, to subscription, and everybody's got subscription fatigue and uh, and it's way more of a high wire performance act for me. You know, I'm singing for my supper in a way that I am not very comfortable with, but I hope that that's a reason <laughs> to, yeah, to give me money. Uh, it, it comes down, for me, I think it comes down to patronage. People should give me money because they want to support the kind of work that I do, and it simply couldn't exist if people aren't willing to give me some money for it. And, you know, it, buried under there somewhere is still the same old value proposition that I had with the books, which is I'll trade you money for good information that's really hard to find anywhere else for a valuable perspective, hopefully valuable enough that you're willing to trade money for it. But uh, but having someone pay five bucks a month and hoping that I just keep producing stuff of interest over time, it's very different <laughs> than selling books. And uh, that's the, the, I've been doing that for about four years now. And I don't, I just don't know how I feel about it. And uh, hardly a day goes by when I don't wake up and think, yeah, why should people be paying me? How do I justify that? And obviously, when I'm in a good mood, I think there are excellent reasons for it. But when I'm in a neurotic mood, not so much. So it depends. But I go out of business if people don't do it. So go to painscience.com slash membership 
and consider joining. It was practiced, wasn't it? It was pretty improvised, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice, nice. I'm not, I'm not a naturally good it. salesman. <laughs> I do what I do. I do it as well as I can, and I hope to hell that people are willing to pay for it. And uh, that's, you know, that's my business model. There is a book called The Art of Profitability. It's a very well written book. You might want to check it out, and it might give you some ideas of what else, what else can be, be now here. Anyway, sure. uh, poor Ingram, that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very enjoyable conversation, and I'd be happy to come back anytime and dig deep into uh, other specific topics.